looking good. Then let's double check the resolution. As many of you in the room will uh, have already heard about IC3 or IZ3, I, th I think it's now IC3, the work that's been done by AMSAT DL to support the whole project. Uh, basically, I think Bochum has been the listening station, the receiving station, Arecibo has been the transmitting station, how uh, a, a, a truly international team have recovered uh, functionality from this uh, space probe that is 36 years old, yeah. something like that. So once again, it's AMSAT DL doing real space science stuff, uh, not just for radio amateurs, but for the whole, I don't know, the whole science, science world. Anyway, Mario's, uh, uh, we're actually quite pleased. We're a little ahead of time now, and I think it's quite important that we get to move on because Bochum is only able to uh, track uh, IC3 for a few minutes more before it's contracted to go off and look at Stereo A or Stereo B. So no, no further ado, uh, Mario DL5 MLO, part one of the IC3 reboot uh, project. Okay. <whistles> ah, test works. <laughs> okay, uh, so then, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction. introduction. Uh, so let's get right into the topic, uh, and that is uh, how AMSAT uh, DL uh, went into, uh, well, supporting the uh, ISEE3 uh, reboot uh, mission. So the quick outline on uh, my talk, uh, I'll have to go through some uh, preliminaries, which is a uh, somewhat sad story, uh, but you'll see uh, in a minute what I'm talking about. Um, then I'll go quickly through the, what's the motivation for, for AMSAT of doing everything. Uh, so I'm then going to uh, give some, something about the history of the ICE3 mission, just in case uh, not everybody here is uh, aware of it. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the Bochum hardware setup uh, that we have to um, talk uh, or actually listen to the station. Uh, I'm going to uh, discuss the uh, reception uh, uh, protocols in a little bit more detail uh, and uh, also else what we've done so far in terms of like Doppler ranging uh, in order to support this mission. So the sad part that I have to uh, talk about uh, is this one, uh, and uh, it's actually a disclaimer uh, in that we are not members of the ISEE uh, 3 reboot project. Um, that is uh, mainly for legal reasons. Um, that um, seems like uh, the ITAR rules that uh, are still active in the uh, United States uh, now even extend to uh, spacecraft that are, well, as old as ISEE is. Uh, and uh, so that means that unfortunately uh, the fr our friends at uh, the ISEE 3 reboot project were not as open uh, to talk to us. So that also means that they could not give us all the documentation that uh, we would have liked uh, uh, to have, which is uh, difficult because even they don't have the full set of documentation. Uh, so uh, we were basically living off the rest of the rest of the rest that somewhere were published on the internet. Uh, and we do not uh, know uh, whether the stuff that we have uh, is the actual, the current flight version or whether this was some other papers. So uh, even here, uh, ITAR uh, has hampered uh, the international collaboration uh, on this project. Uh, so to all the uh, American audience, um, listening to this, uh, I think uh, you really should think on how to get this fixed. I mean, okay, uh, weapons, I can understand that you would want to uh, do something about it, but uh, this is a 30-year-old 
uh, space probe. So once again, um, we try to help when it's possible and when we can and when we are actually told what we can do to help. Uh, but uh, due to the lack of the documents, um, even some of the conclusion that we present here may be wrong. So take it all with a grain of salt. That's uh, all we can do. So now what's ISEE3? Uh, uh, it's the International Sun Earth uh, Explorer, uh, the third spacecraft. Please again notice the uh, slightly ironic sounding international in the name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, uh, uh, the spacecraft was launched in uh, 1978, so that's now uh, almost uh, uh, 30, 36 years. Uh, so this spacecraft is nearly as old as I am, which is uh, also quite amazing when you read some, uh, some of the documents uh, that were prepared like, okay, that's two days after I was born, so... <laughs> <laughs> This is this is very it, it is uh, it's like uh, it's like uh, uh, science and archaeology or something like that. So, um, so the uh, uh, main thing was it was positioned at the halo orbit uh, on the L1 Lagrange point, um, and uh, it was uh, there to observe the Sun Earth interaction, much like uh, the stereo missions uh, or uh, other SOHO and other uh, solar missions uh, are doing now back then. Um, the uh, international comes from the second uh, spacecraft in the series in the series ISEE2 was actually uh, built and operated by uh, ESA so when the uh, uh, solar or the, the the primary mission at L1 uh, came to an end they came up with a quite uh, elaborate uh, sequence of maneuvers, um, and that's uh, how you can see with uh, several of uh, correctional burns, uh, to put this spacecraft now on a trajectory that would allow it to uh, intercept uh, a comet, uh, which is the uh, Giacobini Zinner comet uh, in the in the 80s, uh, and so uh, when the spacecraft. Uh, was then uh, devoted to ch to chasing that comet. They renamed it into ICE, uh, the International Comet uh, Explorer. Uh, what are the spacecraft firsts? Every every spacecraft uh, also even back then had to have a couple of firsts. So this was the first one to achieve a, a halo orbit about the uh, Sun Earth uh, L1 point which is quite an interesting uh, uh, feat in itself. Uh, later, this spacecraft was the first to actually encounter, as in right fly, uh, flew almost close by um, the Giacobini uh, Zinner uh, comet. It uh, had a later close approach uh, to the Halley comet. And uh, the interesting point uh, in terms of uh, for communication for us here is also they've done like the first transcontinental antenna arraying because back then uh, for the comet encounters uh, they had problems closing the link budgets. So what they did is uh, they, they arrayed uh, on an intercontinental basis several antennas uh, in order to improve uh, the uh, received signals, what you see on the diagram. So they had slightly more than 2 dB of gain. Uh, the interesting part here again is uh, they have done this offline, as in they've recorded uh, the uh, the signal on all the antennas and then FedExed or whatever else uh, they uh, ferried the courier uh, or they they they, they fed the uh, the, the tapes uh, to some central location where they then analyzed it uh, and combined this uh, on some VEX machines um, using some Fortran code. So you could even argue that even back then they. Used use software-defined radios uh, in order to do this, even though the, the term has probably not quite been uh, coined at that time. Another thing uh, that they came up uh, even back then was um, that they had plans on what to do uh, when the probe would return to the vicinity of the Earth-Moon system, which is going to happen uh, in August 10th, so about well two weeks' time now. Um, because uh, even then in that newspaper uh, they were speculating about what to do uh, and that 
would have been uh, if they had a working uh, uh, space shuttle or other uh, transport system uh, to maybe even uh, pick up uh, the spacecraft uh, and use it as a, a cheap comet sample uh, return mission because obviously having flown that close to the, uh, to the comet's tail uh, some of the uh, stuff that the comet was made of would now have been uh, deposed on the outside of the spacecraft and uh, so that's uh, what they were thinking but unfortunately uh, they don't have at the moment the capability of doing it so uh, has to wait so the further, the, the further mission of ICE back then as I already mentioned was uh, the comet uh, uh, flybys uh, on Giacobini Zinner and Heli uh, and in uh, 1991 uh, they had a slight mission update to monitor uh, solar CMEs um, and in 95, when this was mainly not used that, mu that often anymore, they turned off the modulation and used the carrier only for radio signs, like uh, what happens to uh, a signal when it passes uh, through the sun corona and so on. This is what you can still study with only a carrier. Uh, official termination of operation then happened in uh, 1997. Uh, uh, and, and on 2008, uh, there was a quick uh, pass by the DSN that tracked and verified the carrier is uh, still there. So now, uh, fast forward to like this year, uh, beginning of this year, uh, there is somewhat uh, a mounting pressure of uh, doing something about uh, the return on the spacecraft. Uh, so there has been uh, some uh, that, well, the, the planetary block has been very uh, active in, in, in pushing for for communicate uh, for co communicating uh, with the spacecraft and also trying to do more things uh, like having it uh, re-enter uh, L1. But uh, the GSFC NASA engineering team came to the conclusion that uh, this was just not feasible because of the equipment that they need uh, to do it had been scrapped and uh, they wouldn't have money anyway. Uh, so that's the the usual problems that uh, you face. Uh, so again, uh, at the amateur DSN and in other emails, we were receiving emails. Oh, have you have you heard about this? And can you do something about that? And what now? And so we had to do something uh, with Bochum Observatory because, as you know, uh, we fortunately have access to a nice uh, little antenna here, uh, which is a 20 meter dish, uh, and it might be. Uh, what we could need here. So in February we went to work. So first of all, you have to look uh, for the, the inf all the information that you can that you can get basically for frequencies and so on of the spacecraft. There is this uh, chap from Australia that put on this document. Uh, I've put the URL here. Um, this has been a pure gold mine of information. Uh, it's about the most uh, complete and most concise uh, collection of information about uh, the spacecraft that. Uh, can be found on the internet. Unfortunately, by now, uh, we do know that it has uh, several mistakes, uh, but most of the stuff that we were interested in it, uh, was surprisingly accurate. The uh, next thing is uh, we have to find the celestial uh, location of the spacecraft because we need to know where to point the antenna to. Uh, again, with a little bit help of our friends uh, at NASA, they uh, were kind enough uh, to provide some solution uh, to us first and then also to include it into the Horizons uh, database that we use as the basis for tracking uh, in, in Bochum so that uh, James then was able to load uh, that uh, trajectory into the Bochum tracking computer. Um, so that would mean we could now point the antenna towards the satellite. Um, we also happen to have a spare, uh, well, not exactly spare, but a uh, USRP that uh, we got from the uh, DLR funding from the uh, stereo project. Um, that when we don't use, uh, that we, when, when we can't use stereo, we can of course use to uh, receive other things. Um, and with a SPX board, and we have that in place, and we had it hooked up to the uh, S band uh, uh, horn already. Um, so we tried to, to see uh, whether we can receive anything, but unfortunately there was no luck. This was not really uh, unexpected because um, the noise figure of the USRP uh, in its, its bare form uh, is uh, not suitable for uh, work like this. Uh, so we had to add an um, G4DDK uh, preamp 
uh, which we had from our uh, Earth Venus Earth uh, project, and um, so that got installed. And so finally, uh, on uh, actually first of March, uh, I had the first uh, detection where I thought, okay, this might be it, but it could not be confirmed because of lots of QRM. The elevation was already very low. Uh, but then on the second of March, uh, we were able to confirm that the uh, uh, carrier of that spacecraft is uh, still present. So we've now be then been the first to actually hear from the spacecraft for several years. Uh, we then uh, forwarded this um, to NASA for uh, confirmation and uh, asked whether they would concur that this is the, de the detection. I mean, we've done the usual things on making sure that this is not a local birdie, as in like point the uh, uh, antenna to some other place and see it go. Uh, also look on whether we can see the Doppler shift, which is, uh, it, all, it all basically means that we've uh, found uh, the spacecraft. So uh, it came quite as a surprise to me that we got our own uh, comic strip basically on the day uh, we, dis we discussed it or we, we discovered or rediscovered it. That back at that time we had not publicly announced this yet. So uh, if you know XKCD, uh, you go there and watch, not now, but uh, that's, uh, I, I, w I was truly amazed on, on, on having that and it's quite good. Um, so now the situa situation uh, analysis for us is what do we have? Well, we have the dish. We know that uh, the uh, B carrier is there. We could not check the A carrier uh, from, from the A transponder yet because it's on the other polarization and there we still had our uh, big uh, uh, couple kilowatt uh, uh, amplifier connected and we did not really uh, want to disconnect that just on a, on, on a hunch. Um, we uh, again checked that we checked and asked, so we did not, we don't have uh, any, any detailed documentation on the telemetry. Uh, but then it was also the, the issue on who's going to talk to the spacecraft. Quick napkin calculation. Now, if we can receive the signal like this, then uh, the uplink should be about the same level and so on. So, yeah, a couple hundred watts, maybe one or two kilowatts should do it. Um, this quickly uh, was foiled in our discussions with NASA then because they then found out uh, in, their, in their documentation that the uh, receiver would require uh, a quite uh, ex quite quite strong uplink uh, signal uh, in order to operate uh, and that would be mainly would ma would be mainly because back then um, the uh, uh, well, the, the, the FETs that they have at the input stage, uh, they would not have uh, even close to the noise figure performance that we can do nowadays and therefore we do have in Bochum. So we are lacking several dBs there and also the idea was that most likely the receive antenna uh, was on a, on a different uh, antenna port with less gain. So. Um, we had to revise uh, the uh, projected power to 10 kilowatts and more, and we just did not see any way on how we could do it in the time that they uh, again predicted that we, we that we would have uh, to do a, a maneuver uh, with uh, the amount of uh, gas that was estimated or in in the spacecraft. Uh, so we had to agree with NASA that this was a no go, and unfortunately we couldn't do anything uh, uh, together. So next is there's been some other uh, detections uh, here at the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, it's barely visible uh, on this this on this graph only because it's like the resolution is downsampled. But you see here a small uh, signal if you look closely. Um, and what's also should be uh, interesting, the signal very much stronger was detected uh, in early April in Arecibo. Uh, why is the signal uh, so much stronger? Well, they have a slightly bigger dish than we have in Bochum. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's the biggest in the world, 305 meters. <laughs> so, um, and uh, then there is uh, Moorhead State uh, University, which is the kind of official uh, or most closely uh, back then integrated station in the uh, ISE 3 reboot project. Uh, they have a, a 20 or 21 meter dish is about the size of Bochum, uh, and they also were now able to uh, detect the signals like as, as, it, it, as it is visible now here. So uh, with NASA saying it couldn't be done, uh, they went uh, to uh, the crowd uh, and they've done the crowdfunding project and uh, Achim is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, to cut the 
story a little bit shorter, they managed to raise the required uh, money to buy a couple of kit, most likely, or most importantly, uh, an amplifier uh, that they could then uh, uh, ship to Arecibo to set up shop there. Um, so uh, another month later, in uh, May 29th, uh, they uh, uh, were able to switch on the telemetry uh, in, uh, from, from Arecibo. So back then they established contact uh, with the spacecraft. Uh, unfortunately, they switched it uh, to a, a downlink rate where the link budget still would not close for Bochum at that time. So getting now to... Getting now to uh, our uh, hardware setup at Bochum, um, we have uh, installed in the meantime then some additional hardware. We can now listen to both uh, polarizations uh, with an additional uh, uh, preamp and a second uh, USRP. Uh, in front of the whole setup, we installed uh, two uh, bandpass filters because we have seen that, especially in low elevation, uh, the USRPs were swamped by nearby uh, uh, 3G uh, transmit stations. Um, it's, I mean, it's it's very bad, so you wouldn't see any sig any signal uh, at all from the from the spacecraft. But now with these filters uh, installed, that's uh, pretty well done. These are all installed in the focus room on, on, on top of the uh, antenna so that the, we don't incur any, any cable loss. Uh, we then run Ethernet uh, down to the control room where we have the uh, PCs. We also uh, got uh, the USRPs hooked up to our station reference, which is a, a GPSDO. There's some uh, pictures from the focus room. Here you see on the right-hand side, uh, you see the filter as um, Achim has uh, aligned it and uh, Michael then uh, installed it. And that means we can now to get to work and go uh, to the thing that really interests us, interests us most, and this is the modulation. Uh, for everyone who does not know the deep space modulation, uh, they use traditionally for several, well, tens of years now, they use uh, uh, PSK uh, because it's just a uh, very power efficient uh, modulation. And they don't use the plain uh, PSK, uh, which is a plus minus 90 degrees uh, PSK, but they use a, a residual carrier uh, PSK, which is uh, shown on the left side in the IQ modulation points. Uh, that means that uh, you always, independent on whether you're going to send a zero or a one, you put some uh, energy in the uh, quadrature phase. Uh, and that means you always have a carrier, uh, which is the residual carrier that you can see in the middle, to track because uh, it's very important to tune correctly and that's uh, what this carrier is doing. You then uh, do for the data itself, uh, you use a, a, a biphase modulation, Manchester, there are several variants of it, uh, just to make sure that at zero uh, there is no uh, uh, data component in the spectrum. Uh, so that you don't interfere uh, with your data and cause a uh, simple uh, interference. Another, another advantage of this modulation is that uh, it's, it's, it's self-clocking, as in you always have a, clock co a, a component of the data clock, so you can always uh, track the data clock as well uh, very easily. So this is a rather low-tech uh, modulation. Nowadays you would have uh, OFDM with pilot symbols and whatnot, uh, but uh, this is uh, doing quite well and um, it's, it's robust. So when, when we think about doing something for our spacecraft, um, this is still the way to go. To go. Now, NASA also learned another lesson, lesson uh, even back then, um, that uh, spacecraft in the amateur terrain uh, are not really uh, learning uh, until very recently, and that is you can improve your link budget significantly by using uh, forward error correction. So back then uh, they were designing uh, forward uh, error correction and they used uh, what, they, what was about the best code that they had at the time. Uh, which is a convolutional code uh, that you dec that you uh, can decode, and they were going okay. The longer it is, the better. So they came up with this uh, rate one half k uh, equal twenty four uh, convolutional code. Now, um, for, ev for for anyone uh, who would be in the coding domain, we would now uh, kind of uh, look uh, extremely uh, at this because uh, this is a 
a really, really huge code, even by, by nowadays uh, things. It's very hard uh, uh, to decode because the complexity to decode it uh, usually goes uh, exponential with the with the length of k, so this is quite a lot uh, that has been uh, to be uh, computed. There are some some other uh, properties uh, of that code that are not of, of general interest for our discussion here. Now, uh, the optimum decoder for a, um, for a code of this uh, of this type is a Viterbi decoder, um, and uh, with the complexity, this was not realizable uh, 30 years ago just no no way to do it they've built the big viterbi decoder several rooms of hardware um and uh even even that would i think not decode this uh this code so back then they used the fano decoder which is basically okay uh, we can estimate when we are going very far off we can find this and maybe correct something uh at a at a very uh, uh much reduced uh, cpu load uh, but of course at the expense of error rate now, with us uh, having only a small dish, uh, we of course want Viterbi because we want to do the best uh, that we could. So, and during that feasibility study, I said, okay, let's go and ask the experts. So, I asked Phil, um, Phil Kahn, who may be well known here as well. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> uh, and uh, asked him uh, whether he would think it feasible uh, to decode this uh, using uh, Viterbi, because I had done some napkin, napkin calculations that it might just work. And so he said, okay, let's give it a try. And he's written uh, the Viterbi decoders uh, that are still quoted as a standard when it comes to speed uh, for uh, the PC architecture. Uh, and he wrote the decoder for it uh, and we came up uh, with a performance figure that's about 2 dB better than what uh, NASA published back then. Uh, numbers have to be uh, taken with a grain of salt because of the, the differences that they used for, for measuring uh, back then, but still it's significantly better. So that's, that's that. We now have a better decoder than NASA had back then. Uh, and we can now apply brute force computing. The, 20, uh, the 512 bits per second uh, performance cannot uh, be reached even on modern PCs, uh, because even on a Core i7, uh, we run only 280 bits per second uh, as, a, as a speed, because we are saturating not the CPU, but the RAM bandwidth. Uh, Phil also volunteered to write the complete uh, demodulation chain that we later used for uh, our work. Uh, if you then want to make sense of the telemetry that you receive, um, again, you run into problems with the documents uh, because we don't have any documents from this mission uh, for the obvious reasons, so I had to improvise. In this case, there is another mission, uh, it's IUE, um, that uh, was launched about the same time. They, they use a similar, if not the same, hardware in the command decoders. Uh, so I thought maybe the uh, thermocouples could also be the same, and uh, for that, for whatever reasons, there are there are probably no mun munitions anymore. Uh, the data has been available on the internet, so I can look and see that. Um, the numbers may do not be uh, exact, but they are helpful. Also helpful is, of course, to look at old telemetry screens so that you can compare what is the approximate range to so what could be the factors. So all in all. Um, this leads uh, to the new telemetry screen uh, that we have now, uh, and also please notice this is in color, uh, which, <laughs> which, is, which is quite handy because uh, we use the color to track changes. And now if everything works correctly, uh, we should be oh. having a live stream from Bochum. Yes. <laughs> of uh, the telemetry. So yeah, that's that. Uh, some of the uh, numbers are quite accurate. For example, the main bus voltage is probably right. Uh, we know that the uh, uh, sun rotation uh, speed is uh, the second, second, uh, second column, uh, second from the top. I mean, that this is uh, pretty accurate. Um, some of the voltages look good, but the temperatures and so on I, uh, nothing at all is correct. Uh, we were wondering all the time on whether the uh, H, uh, HPSB uh, TK pressure, that's a tank pressure here, um, 
whether these were uh, defective sensors or whether they indicated from the beginning that there was nothing left in the tanks. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like the latter is correct. Uh, but again, this is something that uh, is going to be uh, discussed uh, by Achim. Now, uh, what we also can, what we can, what we can also do is, if it works, if I can have the audio on the phone. Uh, no, this does not. Yeah, but it's not right. Let's check. Uh, let's. No. This does not sound right. It sounded better when I tried it five minutes ago. Well, the typical things of you can you can listen to it uh, in, in 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 the break. So that's that's how it sounds. Um, but this you you would hear the tone and you also would hear the data. So huh, unfortunately, yeah, well, as you as as you do as you do with live demonstrations like this, not everything's going to work. With these uh, comments in mind, I'm now uh, having taken slightly more than I was alloc allocated. Uh, I'm afraid I'm now handing over to uh, Achim. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Mario. <laughs> I. As, as, with, as with regard to questions, I would suggest we do this after Achim's uh, talk so that okay. no, uh, nothing's... Uh, oh, not too much overlap. Yeah. Well, okay, but I, I ha the, the, the demonstration of that live telemetry, even if some of it is because of ITAR not clear what those numbers mean, we've actually got a spacecraft that's a bit younger than that, <laughs> where the telemetry looks sort of similarly confused. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for all your work and for your presentation. Now, um, thank you. And we will call you back for, pre uh, for questions, of course. Now, Akim has been a member of uh, AMSAT DL since he was a boy. And he still looks like a boy to me. <laughs> Very, kind. Flattery, but, uh, <laughs> Very kind, thank you. Very kind, thank you. I've known him for, for a number of years um, as um, a very bright man and a great asset for AMSAT DL and an, a, uh, an asset for the whole AMSAT uh, community. Anyway, Akim, uh, part two of the IC Reboot project. Graham, thank you very much. Is this live? Yeah. Thank you very much for these very kind words. Um, it's a bit hard to start from here now. Um, you have seen the disclaimer of Mario in the beginning. I'm kind of reversing the disclaimer right now and saying, it, okay, yeah. As always, the animation doesn't work. It should place the AMSA DL logo on the bottom because I would say now, okay, we're maybe not officially a team member, but I think we played a very critical role in the whole project. So for the next 30 minutes, Think, think an AMSAT logo there, uh, we'll be fine. Uh, some words on the mission director, Bob Farquhar. Um, born 1932, so he's in his 80s by now. And um, you will notice that I'm saying he is, because he's still around. He's still uh, with the IC3 reboot project. Actually, last week uh, I've uh, had a phone call with him. And he used to be also not only a mission director or flight director for IC3, but also for um, other projects like NIR, uh, which landed eventually on an asteroid, Contour, uh, Messenger, and New Horizons. And um, he is a person with has always a little bit ideas which are out of the ordinary. For instance, taking a probe which is meant to measure solar interaction with a magnetic field and just redirect it to a comet. So taking it out of the L1 um, position and putting it on interplanetary um, voyage. And um, then after completion of, let's say, the cometary mission, even putting it with the last final big maneuver on a, on a return course to Earth. So um, all of this planning, trajectory planning at that time without the core i7 processors and so on, you can imagine that is very tricky or has been very tricky, very difficult. Apparently what was not so difficult is getting family to the spacecraft. <laughs> so that was his wife then and his daughter. And um, he kind of always has some personal bindings to the spacecraft. 
Um, for instance, on New Horizons, I think it was New Horizons um, mission, and Bob, if you're seeing this on the internet, I'm sorry if I get this wrong now, but it's in your book, um, which I highly recommend, um, by the way. It's, it's called something like 50 Years in Halo Orbits and can be ordered at Amazon. It's, it's a real gem to read. And he actually put some engraved plaque, um, plaques, uh, um, uh, plaquettes, um, small metal um, pieces with some personal texts on the New Horizons spacecraft. And when NASA found out, um, they obviously didn't like it, so they wanted to take it down. However, these were already included in the center of gravity measurement. <laughs> so they couldn't take it down anymore. So, and that's why they will basically reach Pluto next summer. <laughs> so, and also the uh, return of IC3 to uh, Earth was planned, uh, and there was even an agreement being signed with the Smithsonian Museum. And unfortunately, you can't read it there, because first of all, the animation is, is not working again, and second, it's a very bad um, quality because of this uh, watermark basically in the background, but I can read the, the key message here. It basically says, and furthermore, um, Smithsonian declares its intention to add the, oh no, not, not Smithsonian, but NSAM, NASM, to add the IC spacecraft to the Smithsonian Institution as permanent col uh, collection upon NASA's uh, formal declaration, and if the spacecraft is retrieved and returned to the surface of the Earth. So this is a contract signed um, in fall of 1986. So, and that is basically the orbit. It looks rather boring, let's say. So one of the orbits is Earth, one of the orbits is IC3. You can't actually tell wh which is which without actually labeling them. Um, one of these orbits, or the IC3 orbit, is just 10 days faster per year. So it doesn't take 365 days for one revolution, but something in the order of 355, 354 days. So it will catching up slowly on Earth. And if you now do the same plot again, but with a fixed line Sun-Earth, you can basically see how IC3 basically is going around, around, around the Sun, 1999, um, hidden behind the Sun for, for a couple <coughs> of uh, months, basically, coming out again. And then 2014, and um, even then already the return date was known, 2014, August 10th, um, it should return to the Earth-Moon uh, system. And um, Bob Farquhar ha hasn't given up, and uh, in February 2011, he wrote a letter to the NASA administrator, Charles Bolden, and asked basically for um, reactivating IC3. And thinking about where that could be done, and so on and so forth. Uh, the result has been shown by, by Mario already that basically this engineering team came to the conclusion it's not worth it. And then uh, another exempt from this planetary block um, basically says, and for those who can't read it, I'm, I'm going to read it. Um, so IC3 will pass by us. I wonder if hammer radio operators will be able to pick up its carrier signal. It's meaningless, I guess, but it feels like an honorable thing to do. I kind of salute to the venerable ship as it passes by. Well, that's what I call a challenge. So then, um, as Mary has explained, we were able to um, detect the carrier signal, launch some press releases. Um, shit storms are quite popular. What is uh, not so often, but also very pleasant, is what we call a candy storm. We had all sorts of media um, picking up the story. Um, of course, the ham radio media, like Southgate, ARC, Amsat UK, were, was picking it up. But also non-ham radio media like uh, Spiegel Online, Swiss Radio was doing uh, doing a broadcast over it, uh, Deutschlandfunk German Radio, newspapers, another guest blog in the Planetary Society, Gizmag, and more. So, and then, a few days later, I got a mail from Dennis Wingo. Dennis Wingo, um, KD4ETA, was the project lead of um, Setsad Oscar 33. He calls himself a techno-archaeologist, which is quite close to what Mario has described, like when digging through all the, all the documents, you, you feel like an archaeologist. He's one of the founders of the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project. This basically was taking the old data tapes from this lunar orbiter and basically rescanning them with modern technology and even picking out more details. 
And what is very important, he's a US American and has good contacts in NASA. So all the ITER stuff is not a problem for him. And apparently what is also not a problem, problem for them, together with Keith Cowing, is raising money. Um, we have heard this in the morning. A Kickstarter by itself doesn't generate any money. You have to do something for it. You have to do it the right way. Apparently, they did something really right, because in 30 days, they managed to collect $160,000. That's a lot of money. The plan, reversing the trajectory, basically. So what you see here, the dotted lines, is the original flight path from um, IC3 back then in um, the late 70s and 80s. You see the, the big circle on the left line. That's basically the halo orbit around this Lagrange point L1. And then the upper trace, the upper curve trace, is basically the exit trajectory after swing bang at the moon. You see the swing by point here. And what is basically planned for this year, or for August 10, to do another swing by here again at the moon, bleeding off some heliocentric velocity and just enough to fall back into Earth orbit. So that's the plan. And um, also all of this courtesy of uh, Mike Lux, or at Twitter, Astrogator Mike. And he's also part of the IC3 team. I'm just playing a short snippet of this just to give you an ex impression how close this this uh, lunar swim by needs to be to um, get rid of this extra velocity so that is basically approximately where we are now doing basically a very small swing by at the earth which is now in the middle you can't really see targeting for the moon, 9th of August, August 10th, there you go. And you have to keep in mind this thing is a big drum spinning around its, let's say, central axis. Uh, 19 RPM, that's about three seconds per revolution. And you see the trajectory on the upper right corner. It's close, and you see also the altitude, it's 50 kilometers. So we have to hit a point 50 kilometers above the surface. Luckily, the moon doesn't have any atmosphere. So um, obviously, that's not really uh, easy. Oops. Slideshow. OK, slide. Yeah. But um, I mean, Dennis Winger and his team kept on nagging on NASA. Because, I mean, you can't really try and uh, basically take over spacecraft of them. You need some sort of contract. But if within, I think, six weeks of time, they were able to pull out such a contract with NASA, which I think is also very impressive. But of course, I mean, you can read this document. It's online. It has lots of legal issues in, in it. Um, but two important bits. Team members shall be limited to U US nationals only. And major steps need authorization to proceed from NASA, which is kind of understandable because they don't want to basically that you maneuver the spacecraft somewhere where it couldn't do any harm to let's say existing spacecraft. So about getting to telemetry, Mari has uh, already said that basically uh, the reboot project was using whatever was left by 006 and 007 after the epic fight. Um, it needed however a bit of German engineering and that is the amplifier on the right side. It, that is a four-week design by Dirk Fischer, DK2, 2FD, which um, really had to fight to get this, I think it's 400 watts amplifier um, up and running and shipped to Arecibo in this very short time. I have a few pictures there from the installation. So that's the usual thing, how you move a power amplifier into a big antenna. It's the same in, in Bochum. You need a crane to hoist it up. Um, the crane at Arecibo obviously is a bit bigger. And then it, all of this gets installed. What is really interesting here, if you read this sign here, it says danger high voltage, 65,000 volts DC. That's the Klystron. We couldn't use it, unfortunately. Um, other problems, uh, the, transceive, the transmit receive switching in the beginning had to, do, had to be done by hand. There wasn't any remote line in the beginning. So whenever the people from California were remotely 
wanting to transmit, they had to basically do a phone call and say, hey, uh, switch it to transmit. Then the phone call was going through the co basically central station up to the, uh, to the dome in the focal room. Somebody had to plug in the, um, not 220, but 110 volts. And then uh, changing some uh, attenuators. So this was all done by hand. You can imagine you're in Puerto Rico. It's hot. It's damp. You're sitting in this focal room. It has no ventilation. It, I think it's a nightmare. So it's a big, big thank you to the whole Arecibo team, and especially those three, Phil Perilla, Dana Whitlow, Alessandra, uh, who did all this basically in their spare time. So it's, it's really amazing what they pulled off there. So at some point, Mario already mentioned switching on telemetry. Um, people uh, at the IRP were getting better in commanding and getting more and more routine to it. Fortunately, also, our receiver has a very narrow bandwidth. So just by looking on where the signal is coming from, you can get some feeling about the position, at least in, let's say, two angles, not really in distance. Um, they have seen a deviation already in, in celestial coordinates. So the spacecraft was about half a degree off course where they thought it would be. And um, in the end, it turned out to be fine because they put it even closer to the lunar encounter than what was originally, let's say, predicted. Uh, the problem, however, you can see the angles, but you need the distance as well, the third coordinate. And what you need then is what they call coherent ranging. You basically do an uplink signal from NASA Deep Space, Deep Space Network Station, um, have a bent pipe transponder, a bent pipe system on the spacecraft, downlink it again, and compare the two signals on the ground. Um, they had a few unsuccessful attempts in late June until they finally managed uh, to do it right. Also here, it was a bit of uh, lack of documentation because the problem was you could command IC3 into coherent mode, but if you switch off the uplink carrier for three seconds, it would fall back into standard mode. <laughs> so it doesn't make any, I mean, it's not really useful if you command it on Monday to coherent mode and you want to measure it on Wednesday. And that is a bit uh, a problem. So when they found this out, um, they eventually got, got it to work. And um, then beginning of July, so 2nd of July, that's, uh, well, four weeks ago, they did the spin-up burn. Basically meaning, Mario mentioned it already, you have a sun counter and there, you, kn you knew how fast the spin rate was. It was 19.1 RPM, specification was 19.75. We need to spin it up a little bit. You have a couple of tr thrusters located around the space probe. And there's one set of thrusters, basically, which is there to increase the spin rate a bit. And this is not so much visible here, but just as, a, just as an example, that's the propulsion system um, diagram. So you have hydrazine tanks. That's not hydrazine B propellant, as we use it for Amsat Oscar 13 and 40, but monopropellant, which basically means the hydrazine is, is going with a few valves to the thrusters, and in the th thrusters you have a small catalyst. And whenever the hydrazine uh, hits the catalyst, it will spontaneously just decompose and produce heat and thrust and whatever. So you basically have to open just the thrusters. The hydrazine will be pushed out by nitrogen gas in here. And if you do this at the right combination, and for spin up, it would be thruster A and B. You could de-spin, you could do attitude control, you can do radial delta V. You do this at the right spot. Oh, am I missing one? One slide? No, we'll, we'll come. You do the spin up basically, and this was done with in total something like 30 pulses, 30 very brief pulses. And this was recorded by the telemetry on July 2nd. You immediately see that's the spin rate spin rate going up to 19.7. You also see that uh, what this is called a fine sun sensor started wobbling. And that was mainly contributed to the fact that if you start messing around with this spinning gyroscope, which has 40 meter or 49 meter long antennas, wire antennas, I mean, something will start oscillating. But you also see then eventually that the oscillation will damp out. So we were quite happy about this because we said, well, Everything is still working. We just have to program now the right command, and off we go. So one week later, uh, that was the big maneuver. Big, seven meters per second. 
big in terms of we needed something like 400 pulses, not 30, but only 7 meters per second. That is, I mean, you drive something like 7 meters per second in the city. So it should be achievable. Um, small problem, you needed 400 pulses, but you could only do segments of 63, because the counter register for the pulses inside the spacecraft was only, what is it, 6 bits? It's just not longer. You had to split it in, in sections of 63. And uh, you can basically program when this pulse is going to uh, happen. If you think about a sundial, that's the sun counter, it's a 10-bit counter. You basically tell the thing it has to fire at, uh, I think it was 47 or so. Until that time, um, we also had the telemetry display from Amsterdam up and working again which was quite fortunate because due to some other incident, our uh, basically main web server went down a couple of weeks before. And then we said, okay, if we don't have a web server, we can display the telemetry basically. So Mario was so kind to stream the telemetry to, to Zurich, to my lab, and I was writing a telemetry display where we could graphically also um, display this in real time. And um, yeah. At first, I said, well, I could put it online from, Boch, from, from Zürich, where I work, directly. But then in the very final stage, we said, oh, well, better we mirror this in Amsterdam, and this turned out to be a very good idea. Um, first result of the course correction, um, not good. That's an accelerometer um, plot. And you see that the first few pulses are quite high, but then the thrust is decreasing rapidly the longer the burn, or the longer, the more pulses came. So something clearly is not going right. I mean, you would assume that for, for the duration of the whole maneuver, the, 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 acceleration, the, the acceleration would be constant, and it wasn't. Try this a couple of more times, second attempt, barely any acceleration. Open another latch, something happened. Third try, even less acceleration than the first time. Something is clearly not right. That was the first result of this first evening. The second result. <laughs> I think our web server felt a little bit like the Brazilian goal. Because, I mean, at some point, people were complaining, oh, it's getting slower and slower. We can't access anymore. And then in the end, we found out that basically 500 persons simultaneously tried to access our, our web server. So this was really hard. Thankfully, Dutchman Paul from Twitter offered us some um, other mirror. I'm actually not actually precisely knowing where it is, but he says he's working for a European Space Agency in the Netherlands. You, well, it works. Thank you for that. Second attempt one day later. Similar, we, we used a separate, separate thruster pair, but similar signature. So something, again, is not adding up. And people were thinking already, OK, hydrazine should be still there because something is happening. But apparently, the hydrazine is not really flowing out. So maybe the pressure is gone. So uh, the valves which Mario mentioned might not be actually damaged, but they actually would read zero because nothing is there. And um, at that time, the failure analysis said, well, fuel pressure is still there, but, but actually there was a wrong, wrong command sequence being used. And that was also because of lack of documentation. So the sequence was changed, went for another try on 16th of July. Um, then they said, OK, we have to clean out any residual gases in the pipe, so we do really, really long sequences like 512, which was the other possibility if you had to go beyond 63 pulses. But also then, um, different combinations, long sequences, short sequences, uh, nothing. Uh, July 18th, basically the same. Uh, no smoking gun, literally. Nothing. And um, if anything fails, you take out the hammer. And uh, that is what I think Maggie from AMSAT North America popped up on Twitter and said, the last time we tried this was an Oscar 40 because uh, before the engine basically blew up. So maybe it's not a good thing to do. And I said, well, I know, but <laughs> it's the only thing we are left to, to be done. Um, sadly, again, nothing happened. Really, no thrust, no, no reaction. So that's uh, now two days ago. Um, the IC3 reboot project declared the Interplanetary Science Citizen mission, saying, OK, pressurant has been gone. We cannot do a controlled lunar swing by, uh, so we cannot return to Earth orbit. However, we can switch it to science telemetry and put out as much science as we can. So where are we today? 
this is 12 o'clock UTC, so it's more or less accurate. Earth, Moon, L1, so that's about one and a half kilome million kilometers. We are right now at about 2.2 million kilometers, so that's actually the range where the whole thing should work. And I was hoping to get a prediction for August 10, and I didn't, partly due to the fact because we actually don't really know. The navigation data we have is very is not as accurate as, as we would like to have. The current prediction somehow points to that we will miss the moon by about 11,000 kilometers, which is still impressive, given that the last big course correction has been done, what, 20, 30 years ago. But still, it will be not enough to, to come back to, to Earth orbit. We'll still stay in a sun orbit and, um, yeah, can down, or we will try to download data as, as long as we can. So, lessons learned. Can we bring IC3 back to Earth orbit? No. Did we fail? Mm, I wouldn't say so. Um, we kind of proved that civilians can take over decommissioned spacecraft. However, the biggest problem, obviously, was the lack of time. I mean, this was, all of this started literally se seven, six months ago. Um, Uplink capability is a real problem. I mean, you cannot always go to Arecibo and say, oh, can we have your dish? It just doesn't work. We were very fortunate um, that um, we were basically sneaking in into maintenance periods. But the, the, the backside of this was that all of these uplink passes could literally happen with two hours of pre-warning. So we're basically, we got an email. Oh, can, you, can we use Bochum in two hours of time? And then Mario said, what about stereo? Yeah, so this is really tricky. Um, however, now people are thinking about as long as IC3 is in the Earth, you know, in close Earth neighborhood, so to speak, um, using do-it-yourself deep space network stations, and I I'm, I'm really would like to point to these two um, websites, ufhsatcom.com. Is, is Paul Marsh around? Apparently he isn't. Um, he's running the first website. The second website is Amateur DSN, a Yahoo group, which was also founded by, by Paul and there's a lot of technical information if somebody wants to set up a station like this. Small one, of course, by himself. Acknowledgements. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without a lot of people, and I'm clearly missing, or certainly missing somebody. But we had tremendous support from the AMSAT Board of Directors, especially Michael, for doing all the mesh work. I think Mario and myself, we haven't been at, in Bochum since a year. So we were doing all the stuff basically by remote, Whenever there had to be a LNA installed, M Michael was doing uh, this, and he had to drive a couple of hours, basically, to do this. Thilo, Sternwarte Bochum, Phil Kahn, the ma decoder magician, uh, James for keeping track, again, literally. I mean, um, he was double-checking our trajectory to lose solutions. Florian was um, handling our web server after he came back from the game Brazil against Germany. Dutchman Paul for helping us out with the mirror, the whole Arecibo staff, uh, Mike looks for the um, plots I've shown, and of course the whole IC3 re reboot team. And uh, to conclude with these wells, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, earlier today we saw a video that, uh, that Jim showed of... Uh, uh, of Valter doing some educational outreach at, at a school and one of the girls sat there and said wow I think I'm going to say wow uh, most amazing uh, most amazing achievement uh, uh, and uh, we are so so proud actually of being of you taking time out to come over and tell us about it this afternoon. It's been really inspiring. I'm sure there are lots of questions. I've got lots, but let's not use the chairman's prerogative. Questions? One there. How, how sure are, we, are the calculations? Because we've heard 50 kilometers off the moon and 50,000 kilometers off the moon. Uh, what about if it goes the other way? Could it go the uh, other sure way? the calculations? I honestly don't know. I explicitly asked for error budgets and error ranges from the last measurement. We just don't know. So um, see a large hole in the it'll be a small hole. It's only 500 kilos and about that one and a <coughs> half meters, I think. 
but it, it'll be a small hole. You won't notice. I promise. <laughs> You did mention that you did coherent ranging with NASA's DSN. Is that correct? Or did you do the ranging with some other ground station? Because I didn't fully get that. Um, the primary ranging would have to be done with, with NASA DSN. Basically, yes, there was an arrangement with it. one of the uh, stations in Goldstone, California. That's DSS-24. That's a 34-meter dish. Uh, we tried in the last couple of passes ranging with Arecibo, but apparently I think at least we weren't able to, to, to analyze the data yet because we were lacking some uh, critical data from, from, from Arecibo. And I haven't heard anything if the IC3 reboot team have, have uh, analyzed the data as well, yeah. But then, I mean, um, coherent raging, uh, there's a very good document on DSN how coherent raging works. It's, it's, it's a bit tricky. You, ha you have to know what you're doing. Just extracting Doppler is one thing, but then extracting complete range is very, very uh, tricky. Have you spoken to the people from ESA or ESOC at Darmstadt? Because they can do coherent ranging as well. Um, yes, but um, strangely in the past, and also I think I tried once to contact ESOC uh, for IC3, uh, strangely in the past it was even more difficult to get information from ESOC than from the US Americans. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise. Don't know, don't know why. Uh, we've got certainly w w one from the internet, from P0SAT. P Will there be more space archaeology from the uh, IC3 group, uh, reboot group? Do you know if there are, if there are other, other, other spacecraft out there that something similar could be done, to, done with? To be honest, uh, I don't know, so... Well, I, I've just read, I think yesterday or this morning, that the Spitzer telescope, which was about to be decommissioned, got another extension of two years. So we are not getting this one. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> not, not yet but uh, two years of time, I think this will be re renegotiated. So, but uh, to, to my knowledge, no. OK. All right. Any, any, any other questions? Uh, yeah, that was a question about DSN over the internet, which I think effectively we've answered. Oh, OK. Microphone coming your way. From the internet, uh, G3 uh, RWL. In previous years, we heard that uh, Borkham was being used for other reception for NASA. Was this abandoned in order to chase ISEE3? Could you repeat the first part again? Was, what was abandoned? Uh, Bochum has been used for, by NASA for tracking other spacecraft. Did, we, did you have to abandon other uh, spacecraft tracking? I, I uh, presume Richard's talking about stereo. Yeah, it's probably about stereo. Yes, uh, we are using stereo uh, to track, uh, or we, we are using Bochum to track stereo uh, all the time. This is basically a, a project that even got funded by uh, the German uh, ministry in DLR uh, recently, and we have uh, worked very hard uh, to make sure that we do not uh, have to have to sacrifice uh, a stereo performance. So, for example, on the the last uh, uh, event, uh, I said, "Okay, you can you can have Bochum for the first 30 minutes. Then we'll have to wait uh, about one hour, uh, and then we can have Bochum again for another uh, hour uh, because." Stereo tracking has priority, but uh, sometimes uh, the DSN is tracking one of the stereos, and then we have another uh, station uh, in the stereo ground station uh, network, which is uh, Kiel. Um, so uh, per Dudek, uh, sometimes uh, when, when, when we get these emails half an hour before the track, uh, I, I then went on the phone uh, asking uh, per Dudek, uh, he's, he's running the Kiel section, say, can you take off uh, that stereo B because stereo A, which you are tracking, is tracked now by the DSN, so that we have Bochum free to support ISS, uh, uh, yeah, I, ISEE. So the, the idea really was uh, make sure that uh, the stereo uh, gets priority. Uh, and we kept to that. Now, um, fortunately uh, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, during the next uh, years, this will be slightly uh, uh, easier because uh, they will have to shut uh, down uh, stereo uh, during the uh, uh, sun, um, when, when, during the, the period when stereo is behind the sun. So we'll have about one year where we don't have to track stereo. So at that time, we can then uh, look for maybe other uh, spacecraft. So <laughs> that's that. 
Thank you, Mario. Uh, any other questions? If not, just again, thank you very, very much, both of you, for all the work you're, you've done and are going to carry on doing. And thank you again for coming and telling us about it. Thank you. Thank you.